People haven't talked about race when I was a kid. It wasn't something, it was I don't see color, which is a little crap. What do you really know about your own race? It was probably white privilege. I, I can't say like, I was white privilege. I grew up in a home with a single mother. About racism. It's not enough to be aware. And what it takes to fight it. But are some taking the fight too far? It's just ruining people's lives. Fired for making controversial comments online. Did it change their beliefs or backfire? Good evening and welcome to Facing Race. I'm Joyce Taylor. There was no ignoring the outrage over racial inequities here in Seattle this past spring. Across the country, people were asking, what's happening in the Pacific Northwest? As protesters took over part of the Capitol Hill neighborhood, the so-called CHOP, the Capitol Hill Organized Protest. It was very visible and very polarizing. Well, now it's gone. But was it an effective way to fight racism? Many experts say to make real change, it takes more than just protesting. You have to change systems, and we all have to challenge our own understanding of racism. The first step can be uncomfortable. You have to be able to talk about it. For many white people, this is the first time they're having any conversations about race. Have you reached out to friends of color to talk about race and racism? I don't actually know, like, too many people of color. Our school is mainly white. It's most certainly a part of the problem, if not the problem, and it needs to stop. People need to see with their own eyes and experience other people who have different experiences and different relationships with race and racism. There's built-in biases, something that needs to be changed, and, and we talk about changing it, I mean, to the best of our abilities. We sent Mark Wright out with King 5 race consultant Caprice Hollins to chat with white people about their understanding of racism in America. You're about to hear frank conversations with two people who see racism through two very different lenses. We set up our microphone at Juanita Beach Park in Kirkland. I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk with us. We're here to ask people if in their day-to-day -day lives they're talking about race. Why? Hi. Because race educator Dr. Caprice Holland says if we're going to make progress on racism, every single one of us needs to do our part. And that starts by talking about it. There's no excuse for not learning. Thomas Gibson stepped up. He's a first year Army Scout from Joint Base Lewis McCord. Like being in the military, I deal with a whole bunch of different groups of nationality, ethnicity, all that. Thomas says he's the first to call out racism. He can't stand it. I will literally kick somebody's ass if it offends another person, because there's just no point in it. Don't say something rude, just keep it to yourself, all right? Walk away. But like many Americans, he doesn't talk about race a lot, and he doesn't believe white privilege exists. Do you think that you will have more opportunities as a white person than a person of color? Never, never. I think I will absolutely have the same opportunity as any person that stand next to me. But no more opportunities than a person of color? No, no more opportunities than any person of color. So obviously, Thomas, the military is a diverse pool of people, yet at the very, very top, mostly white, mostly men. Why do you think that's the case? And most of the times, yes, officers are going to be white. I don't know what that is. I don't know. I didn't go You think it could be racism? It could either, I can't, I can't say it would be racism, honestly. That's when King 5 race consultant Caprice Hollins steps in. Have you ever talked with any of your peers in the military about whether or not they think that racism exists in the military? I think there was one. There was only one. and One conversation? Yeah, one conversation. It was, uh, I can't for the life of me. I asked Dr. Hollins to weigh in on Thomas's perception. Her thoughts? He's a good guy. He doesn't tolerate overt racism, but he just told us he's not talking about racism. And that's part of the problem. He has this sense of fairness that he's willing to engage someone to say, this is not okay that, for example, black people are treated this way. But he doesn't understand how racism manifests itself in more subtle ways. Subtle ways like missing out on a promotion, getting paid less or being followed in a store because someone assumes you're a shoplifter. 
The way we understand the deep-seated subtlety of racism in America, we've got to start having those difficult conversations. Dismantling racism is not easy, and white people are gonna have to give some things up, right? They're gonna have to take risk and get it wrong and feel uncomfortable and not have all the answers. Meredith Acri is ready to take those risks. People haven't talked about race when I was a kid. It wasn't something, it was, I don't see color which is a little crap. But these days, she's having a lot of tough talks about racism. I've actually made an intentional uh, choice when I make friends to make friends of different backgrounds. These are conversations I'm having all the time. At she's reading, she's trying to learn and educate herself. You can't interrupt racism if you don't understand it, right? And so a part of what I love that you're doing is that you're not asking people of color to tell you what to do. You're developing an, a lens so that you can begin to see things um, where they need to be interrupted. Have there been moments when Meredith got it wrong? She says yes. I messed up with a friend and I overstepped and, and took away her voice when discussing something about race at work and she had to talk to me about why that was wrong as a white woman doing that. And um, it's a healthy conversation because as much privilege as I have, I'm um, blind in a lot of ways still to the impacts that I have, even when I'm well-intentioned. So I also appreciate your openness and your humility around that so that when people of color do give white people feedback, Mark, that they don't see it as, you know, we're saying you're racist or we're saying you're a bad person, but just be open to hearing how this impacted, you know, how this impacted me. Meredith says she'll keep talking. She feels she has to. And if you're watching and you're not talking yet, that's okay. It's not too late. There's a long way to go. I'm sorry, that makes me a little emotional just because, like, it's unfair. What, what is the emotion about I feel for you? like, I just feel like people of color and black people have gotten the short end of the stick and it's unfair. And there's just so much more we can do. And I hope that by the time my son is an adult, this is a completely different landscape. Very different views on race and racism. Ask yourself this question. Are you aware of your own biases? Maybe you think you don't have any? Well, guess what? There's a test you can take to find out. Natalie Swaby shows us a popular test that claims to reveal hidden biases. My name's Deontay Damper. I'm from the south end of Seattle, and I'm the LGBTQ chair for the NAACP King County. My name is Hector Peng. I was born in Hong Kong and moved here when I was six. And I've lived in Washington pretty much my whole life. I'm Pat Murakami. I live in Seattle in the Mount Baker neighborhood, and I own an IT firm. When have you felt discriminated against? How many, t how many times in your life? Uh, I, 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 do we have enough time? I don't think we have enough time to talk about how many times I've been discriminated against. I come from a mixed background. But interestingly enough, I don't, I, I never really feel racism. We can't keep on acting like racism doesn't exist. That we need to have experiences where we put ourselves in other people's uh, place and realize that, that the barriers are huge for some people. I see a lot of pain. Do you think you have bias? Like, I, I'm pretty sure, like I know I have some implicit bias. I know I do. Do you think you have any biases? I, I think I'm somewhat biased against people of my own race. No, I don't have any biases. No. <laughs> what do you think about taking this test today? I am nervous, but what is there to be nervous about? I mean, it's just a test, right? It's everybody. What is our job? What, where, what is racism? Am I racist? If, and if I am, what do I do about it? And implicit biases are attitudes and are capable of producing unintended discrimination. Why is this implicit bias there? It's because our culture has been filled with racial stereotypes. Uh, it's in literature, it's in history, it's in entertainment media. All right, here goes nothing. How religious do you consider yourself to be? None of your business.
Okay, I'm done. You are done? Okay. So go ahead and tell me what, what was the result? Uh, I have a slight automatic preference for African Americans over European Americans. And what are you, were you surprised by that? I'm not really surprised. Let's talk about your results. Okay. Okay, so my results says you have an automatic preference for black people over white people. Is that what you expected you, your answer might be? Yes, I did. I do have a moderate automatic preference to European Americans over Afri African Americans. The question is, what do I do with it? And I, I like to think of myself as somebody who's not racist, like, ah, like, and yet I know, by knowing that I have a preference, I think I can account for that. One thing we know is that taking the IAT is by itself not a cure for implicit bias. It is at best an educational and in informational tool. So what we need to do is to arrange for prevention of those implicit biases from having impact that causes uh, more simply discrimination. I know I'm biased, I, I know, and I'm, I'm privileged. I got work to do. No, I really do. If you want to take the bias test, you can find a link online at king5.com slash facing race. The culture of calling out racism has taken on new life online, where controversial Facebook groups and Twitter brigades are dedicated to outing people they've labeled as racist. So we wanted to know what happens after someone's exposed? What happens to their lives? Have they changed their way of thinking? Or has it backfired? Kara Alfallen tracked down two women months after they were fired because of their Facebook posts. They were going to be slaves anyway. Now they're free. So why are you guys out here testifying for the Asia Jones and her mom Daphne are rooting out racists with their Facebook group, exposing racism in the PNW. 4,217 pending <laughs> posts. posts about racist people. The common goal, finding racists and putting them on blast. For years I was like, man, I wish there was somewhere I could go where I could see like the racist companies, business. I definitely did not see it reaching 12,000. That's a lot of people. The group's strategy is part of a growing online movement. So next this calling in over calling out. Dr. Relina Joseph recognizes it as cancel culture. Really, it's about calling out these moments of, of racism, of sexism, of homophobia. They are canceled, right? You're canceled from whatever platform you're on because we don't approve of what you've done. She's a professor at the University of Washington who explores the topic with various groups in racial awareness sessions. You've probably seen the trend on social media. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. This woman publicly shamed, then fired after racist posts and exchanges went viral. The first thing people revert to is, where do they work? You don't deserve to be working in public if you are a racist person. So far, members of Exposing Racism in the PNW have made sure dozens of people were fired from their jobs. I don't want it to just end at someone being fired. You know, we should be able to do something else and move forward. Her group doesn't usually follow up with the people they've exposed, including Jenny Cleland and Brandy Potter, who were fired from their jobs. If I go out in public, I'm like, oh my gosh, did they see my post? Do they know my face? In June, Brandy posted an all live splatter meme on her Facebook page. My post was nothing racial. The meme became popular following Black Lives Matter protests in the streets. I don't believe that they need to be like on our main streets or on our highways. I definitely regret posting that. The meme was shared in exposing racism in the PNW. Having protests outside my work to get me fired, people spreading my face all over Facebook as being a racist person and slander. What do you want people to know about you? What do you have to say? I'm not a racist person. I'm Mexican-American. I don't believe in racism. I believe that all lives matter. It, it, race to me is race. The more we talked, the more it became clear that being canceled on social media shut Brandy down. I don't like talking about racism. It's definitely easier just to back away from that stuff and just be like, you know what, I'm staying out of it. Being identified as a racist is like being identified as a, as a child molester or a murderer, right? There's, there's nothing worse in the world. Bringing that word of racist or racism in shuts people down from being able to actually talk about their actions. Oh, I'm like, I'm fidgeting. I'm nervous. Okay. Oh, no, 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 you're
you're fine. At first, Jenny Clellan doesn't want to share what she posted. I'd rather not say. After being canceled, she's anxious about being harassed. Listen to what she says mid-interview. So Are they going to, like, shoot me or something? Like, the group? What do you mean? Like, see this and then try to kill me? What she posted got her fired from her job at a preschool in Lake Taps in June. People will call me racism. Total accident. It's not what I meant. And it hurts me because I'm the most caring person anybody can ever meet. Jenny eventually agrees to tell us about that Facebook post, which she wrote after passing a protester on the side of the highway. I'm tired driving home. And the, she was holding up a Black Lives Matter sign, which I totally agree. Black Lives Matter. All lives matter. I mean, I pat her back. Then I said, and I kind of wanted to run her over, which I didn't want to run her over. There's no way I'm going to run her over. I mean, <laughs> I have learned to be more careful with my words. Do you believe in our society that racism is a problem? Not for me, <laughs> but um, no. Because people are like picketing, you know, Black Lives Matter. Why do you think people are standing out there with those signs? I don't know. I know that the cop did kill that one guy, but I didn't even see that, what happened, because I don't watch TV. I just heard about it. <sighs> yeah, that girl, she definitely didn't educate herself. She didn't even know George Floyd's name. I know, you know, it's like simple things. She could have simply just looked up why are there protests going on right now? Asia watches Jenny's interview. Are they gonna like shoot me or something like the group? Did she just say what I think she just said? Try to kill me or? Why would she think that? No, I have no, 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 no. There's people trying to shoot us. You know, I feel like this is just something that tells me, oh, maybe we shouldn't be more vocal. Maybe we should be less vocal on Facebook or watch the words we say, but I don't think it's gonna change their ways. No, I don't think that's gonna happen. So does cancel culture work? When people have asked me that question, they're expecting me to say no. And the saying of no to me means telling, telling a certain group of people to be silent. And I'm not willing to tell anyone to be silent around questions of race um, ever. What we need are these larger ways of creating education and structural change. I can't say even do anything to the individual solves much besides, you know, getting that individual out that establishment. Beyond that, I can't really, I genuinely can't say that it solves racism. It doesn't encourage people like Brandy to want to talk about race or people like Jenny to want to learn about it. I guess that's a good thing to think about. And I could think about how we can go about educating them. Like, like I said, I don't think it's really an interest of theirs, you know, from what I've seen, you know, but it's something I could always look into. F George Floyd, F Black Lives Matter. Asia and her mom don't plan on stopping. I just think it solves the problem for the minorities and the people who don't like racism. It brings us a sense of peace because we can do a little bit of something. There's not much we can really do, but with this, we have a little peace of mind. How do you even start talking about race or racial inequities? To help, we put together a resource guide you can find online. For a link, text the word guide to 206-448-4545. It includes a long list of resources to help. Historian Ibram X. Kendi says the heartbeat of racism is denial, and the heartbeat of anti-racism is confession. He's one of the leading scholars on race in the United States and the director of anti-racist research at Boston University. He's also the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, How to Be an Anti-Racist. In his book, he says it's possible to be racist one minute and anti-racist the next. He says one way to fight racism is to start talking about race early when our kids are still babies. Tell us what is the difference between not being racist and being anti-racist. The difference is to be willing to admit the times in which we're racist. Those who are saying they're not racist are never admitting the times in which they're racist. To be anti-racist is to recognize the racial groups as equals. To the millions of people now who are sitting 
home on their couch and they're watching what's unfolding in our country and they're saying to themselves, I don't know what to do. I just don't know how I can participate. And so they would say that they're anti-racist, but they're neutral in their participation to end racism. Are they part of the problem? Yes, it's not enough to be aware. We need you as part of this struggle. If an American can look out at their country, and not just a country that's unraveling for people of color, but for white people, for everyone, then I'm not sure what they're looking at. How can we just sit around while, while the country is unraveling? We need every single person to be a part of this struggle to save and rebuild this country and to make it anti-racist. Do you believe anyone can be racist? Black people, white people, brown people? I'm seeking to ask a different question. And, and that is, I'm asking every single person, no matter the color of their skin, are they being anti-racist? Do you believe that there's nothing wrong or right with any racial group? Are you supporting policies that are leading to equity and justice? You know, are you recognizing that if there's racial inequities, it must be because there's something wrong with bad policies as opposed to bad people? And to those scholars who would argue that this intense focus on race that we see right now, for example, is a dead end to progress, you would say what? How do you solve a problem if you ignore the cause? If the cause of racial inequities is racist policies, you can't eliminate racial inequities unless you acknowledge and eliminate racist policies. You know, just as the cause of gender disparities is sexist policies. Increasingly, we're seeing this canceling out of people who are saying racist things or posting racist things. Is that an effective solution? On the one hand, there are people who say racist things and when we point it out, they admit it, they seek to repair, they seek to transform themselves, and you, you can obviously see the ways in which they're doing that. I don't think those people should be canceled. There are other people who say racist things and do racist things and continue to do it over and over again, and we continue to point it out over and over again, and, and then they continue to say they're the least racist person you've ever interviewed over and over again. And to me, those folks should be canceled. You have also written a children's board book, The Anti-Racist Baby, and a teen edition of Stamped from the Beginning. First, why write a book for babies? I wanted to ensure that parents knew that we need to be raising our children as early as possible to be anti-racist. We need to be teaching our children the beauty of the human rainbow um, and how all those different skin colors are all equally beautiful. We need to be teaching our children as early as possible that, that white people don't have more because they are more. And we need to be teaching our children that black people don't have less because they are less. When I tell my daughter, and it's the same thing I tell myself, which is that you can't bring about change unless you believe change is possible. So no matter how bad it gets, no matter how dire it seems, no matter how big the odds are against you that change could happen, you must believe in that change because it's what's gonna fuel you. If you ask Dr. Kendi, being anti-racist is about taking action. We met a Seattle artist protesting with a pen, creating portraits of people who've lost their lives to police violence. As Taylor Murphan Dureski shows us, for him, it's all about timing. I feel eager to, to start his piece, um, even though I know it won't be finished. Seeing that he was from Kent and was killed by Kent police officers definitely caught my eye. You know, the idea of time and, and how fragile it feels for some, but not all. I think this is a good way to bring that to paper. My name is Adrian Brandon. I've been working on a series called Stolen, which focuses on black lives lost by the hands of the police. Luckily, a lot of artists do create these beautiful portraits of these victims, and that is needed. I think it's great to celebrate the lives that they did have, but I really want to kind of show the lives that they didn't have. Tamir Rice was 12 years old. This is Chantel Davis. She was 23 years old. This is Miriam Carey. 
She was 34 years old. I will set a timer, so if they were 18 years old, I'll set a timer for 18 minutes. For every minute or every year that they lived, I spend that long um, within minutes of painting that piece. So Giovanni was 20 years old when he was killed. I kind of push the timer to the side. I don't look at it. Um, and so that creates this sense of panic while I'm creating the piece, knowing that the time is going down and I'm not going to be able to finish the whole portrait. I'm feeling very anxious, kind of stressed out, and these feelings are supposed to mimic the feelings that black people feel living in America today. Um, we're not afforded the luxury to always be at ease when the cops pull us over. When the timer hits, it's a range of emotions. I feel sadness first and foremost, um, heartbreak that that was it. I'm trying to picture what the full piece would have looked like had there been no timer. It's frustrating as an artist just to not be able to finish a piece and then to realize that that represents something so much more intense and emotional and that it's a life that wasn't complete. You know, it's, it's a way for me to grieve. So I'm left with this unfinished piece and the viewer is left curious about what would more time have allowed. What would it look like if I did have 20, 30, 40 more minutes, two hours to complete the piece? And that's what families are left with. They're left with, okay, what was our son gonna be? He was 18 when he was killed. Was he gonna, you know, live out his dreams to be X, Y, and Z, or, you know, it just gets people thinking. That's the whole point of this, is for them to see these faces and say, oh, first of all, why isn't the face covered? Where were they from? What did they like to do? How did they get killed? So when you see the whole series with 50 names and stories out there, this isn't just Michael Brown, this isn't just Tamir Rice, or Sandra Bland, or George Floyd, or Breonna Taylor. This is a whole list of names that we've been trying to grieve and, and seek justice for and support one another with. Talking about race can be intimidating for some people. So every week on Facing Race, we're asking our experts your anonymous questions, things you may be too embarrassed or too afraid to ask. It's a segment we call Frequently Awkward Questions. I love my parents dearly, but in all honesty, they're quite racist. What can I do or say that will have a positive influence on them? Is there hope that they will ever change? Here to answer is Dr. Relina Joseph, Professor of Communications at the University of Washington. White people, please do not give up on your racist relatives um, because we need for you to talk to them. You ask clarifying questions. You try and keep your tone neutral. Try and keep it as cool as possible in order to enter into a really thoughtful conversation. That's how we try and push people and move people. Um, not by trying to kind of beat them down into submission. That's not going to work with these conversations. What questions do you have about race that you just haven't asked because it felt awkward? We're getting answers for you. Just text FAQ to 206-448-4545. Next week on Facing Race, policing in the Pacific Northwest. You know, I was only 15, but you know, after that I just kind of realized like, you know, this is the real world, you know, being, being black, you know, in America. A high school basketball star. A harrowing traffic stop. He just came up to the window and, you know, had his gun out, told us not to move. Was he racially profiled? Do you think, Dad, that this would have happened if those boys were white in a car? N not at all. I, mean, I, just, I just don't. Plus... You want to have your hands visible at all times. We're there for the talk. Black families say they can't afford not to have with their children. We're teaching our kids how they got to act a certain way so they don't end up dead. For more information on tonight's show, including how you can take the bias test and the full interview with Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, also the artwork from Adrian Brandon, text the word race to 206-448-4545. We want to thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again next week for Facing Race. Good night.